Peace and safety, timely temple templates. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. We are at an incredible prophetic time that we've been guided by scripture and the prophetic time by the celestial clock. And this is something we always need to keep in mind as we review our recent videos and everything we've been studying coming together at this time. We don't get an understanding of the time necessarily from the enemy action. That isn't what we are watching or even necessarily the peace and safety calls, although that is the primary sign that we would see. But what is of importance is that we see it in context of what scripture says we would see and when we would see it. That there would be celestial signs that tell us the great and terrible day of the Lord is coming. We've seen these in the last generation, in the latter part of the last generation too. So we are not surprised then that the warning calls of peace and safety go out that also tell us that sudden destruction is coming. That is something we already knew. The children of darkness are certainly busy at this late hour, but they are not orchestrating the world's events. They cannot make that sudden destruction come until they are fully unrestrained. They are pacing their narrative and events in relation to the celestial and prophetic time. They cannot change that. They have no influence over that. The celestial heavens, the wonders that have been shown in the heavens, that is what tells us the prophetic time. Scripture and the geopolitical events that we were told we would see, the replanting of Israel. Within that time frame, there have been the incredible wonders that we have seen in the heavens. The star Bethlehem events, the Revelation 12 sign, the sun being turned into darkness and the moon into blood. The celestial clock is what is primarily telling us that we are almost out of time. The great and terrible day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord, that day of indignation, that day that we are told we would see approaching. So don't get focused only on what the enemy is doing and thinking that maybe they're trying to manipulate the prophetic time. They cannot manipulate the prophetic time. They are acting in response to the prophetic time because they already know what time it already is. They can't orchestrate these prophetic and celestial events. They can only respond to them like we are supposed to be responding to them. So don't get your eyes distracted on the enemy, what they're doing, and think that they are fully manipulating the narrative. No, they have their storyline. They have their thing that they're doing in response to the celestial and prophetic time. And we are told that we should live in light of the celestial signs. What is declared on the very first page of the Bible that they will be for signs and for telling time. And that also reminds us of what we see presently on the last page of the Bible, those portrayals of signs reminding us that our Redeemer is coming quickly. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So many things from the celestial clock, what the heavens declare. That is why we are watching at this prophetic time. Right here where we are also observing the geopolitical events, the checklist that Jesus Christ said would be present, the state of the world, how it would be when he comes, the Son of Man when he comes. It's going to be the days of no unlocked, life going on as normal. It's going to be within a certain time frame of the last generation. And also within that time frame, you'll hear the enemy give their code words about peace and safety, that you know sun destruction is coming. That is going to be in context, though, of when we look up and lift up our heads. For our redemption draweth nigh. We will know our redemption draweth nigh and have an understanding of that from what Scripture says and what the celestial heavens declare. And particularly since 2015 with the Star of Bethlehem events, just like the wise men, we have gone out with the expectation that our king is coming. We are going out to meet the king, knowing that he is nigh even at the door, and there is a time frame where he is coming, and we can see the conditions in this world are drastically changing. As we have now entered into the birth pangs that were also foretold in Scripture, that would happen within a certain context, and that we should not be surprised as we see that great and terrible day approaching. We are already in the birth pangs right now, which means the birthing of sun destruction is not that far off either. We know time is very, very short. And it is in all this context that we have been looking at the timeline, looking at the multiple things that the Lord has brought our attention to, and just praise the Lord for all the insight and wisdom to the depth coming together right here. The celestial signs, the wonders declared in the heavens, the wonders shown in scripture. So many incredible things about this time that we know our Father has guided us by the hand, bringing us hither to. Why? Because he wants us to know the time. He is the one who told us to look up, to lift up our heads, and he's also the one who drew us to look up and lift up our heads and drew our attention to multiple things and then gave wisdom on those subjects as we explored them more and as we tried to seek them out. Lord, why are you showing this to us? Father, show me why this is important. 
And so as we have gone forward like the wise men, it has been a learning journey. It's a lustral learning journey, just like the wise men learned incredible things. But here especially, we are seeing the time declared on the clock. We see prophecy being fulfilled around us with the birth pangs. Everything accelerating also to a time, a very narrow window time that our Father has brought our attention to. Right here with the heavens reminding us of Aquarius, the one that pours out the living water, the fish that were redeemed. But then the days of Noah and Lot, the celestial sea as well. Right here at a transition time that also reminds us of the old covenant versus the new covenant. The ending of the year meets the beginning of the year, the alpha and the omega concept, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. A lot of these same concepts that we see emphasized in the last page of the Bible that our Father has brought our attention to over the past few months giving us time to explore and then see the ripening of the world events right now. It is so beautiful how our Father is showing us increasing depth to why He showed us and brought us to this particular place. Because there is so much richness and depth to this. And the more that we search out Scripture and understand the tapestry of redemption, the more we will see the day approaching. If we only have a shallow understanding of salvation and the plan of redemption, we will only lightly see the day approaching, or may not even fully see it at all. But the more that we see what Christ has done, what is He going to do, the more that we can see the day of when He's going to do what He's going to do. We can see it declared in the heavens, in prophecy, in Scripture, talked about by the apostles. And we can also start to see more and more how the New Testament church had the same understanding of the connection of the plan of redemption, the plan of salvation, what Jesus Christ did, the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant, how that is important as we look unto Jesus Christ to appear the second time. We will not be able to fully and truly see the day approaching until we can see it the way we're supposed to see it, to see it as the working of Jesus Christ. And so this is important while we have a Christian perspective of what's going on in the world right now. There's tons of channels on YouTube and they'll give you all sorts of secular ideas and some crazy ideas too. But here especially, where we know the hour is very late and the birth pangs are increasing every single day, we need to insist on a scriptural perspective, a biblical perspective, watching and being sober, being grounded in reality, being grounded in scripture, not fantasy, not wild Hollywood notions. No, being grounded in Scripture. What does Scripture say? And when we have our perspective through what Scripture says, we will be able to see what Scripture shows. And then we will see the day approaching so clearly. So we are at a very, very incredible time. And our Father has brought our attention particularly to, again, this threshold of the year ending and the year beginning on the biblical calendar, which apparently is going to be April 2nd through the 3rd. Somewhere right in there. It is also, and this is not coincidence, the same time as the ending of 120 days countdown from the celestial sign of the sun being turned into darkness and the moon to blood. Which actually foretold us that the great and terrible day is approaching. So again, that reminds us of the days of Noah and Lot that that's only for a certain time and those days are going to run out. And we certainly see the enemy activity, they're ramping everything up to change and build to a certain conclusion that will change the days of Noah and Lot. So there's a lot that tells us that we are running out of days and hours. We do not know the day or the exact hour, but we have a very good idea. And so we are watching for our Lord to come. We are going to be the wise and faithful servants. Particularly understanding the more that we have an ear to hear what he says and what scripture says, the more we will be able to see the day approaching. And friend, especially at this late hour, I want to be able to hear my Father. And the only way we're going to be able to hear our Father is if we are staying near to Him and drawing nigh to Him. And following Christ's instructions of watch and pray always. Keep your lines of communication open with Jesus Christ, our Father. If we regard iniquity in our heart, the Lord will not hear us. And so it is imperative at this late hour that we purify ourselves every single day throughout the day. We keep those communication lines open. We pray always. While we watch, while we remain sober, understanding that time is very late and we are running out of time. As we talked about in our last video, the first day of the first month, that is when the tabernacle was officially set up, Exodus 42. And that is because the Old Covenant covered from the very first day of the year all the way to the last day of the year, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. But then what Christ completed, when he completed those figures of the true, he became a greater and more perfect tabernacle. So we also see picture-wise the greater and more perfect tabernacle, the New Covenant, 
went into effect. It also covers from the very first day of the year all the way to the last day of the year. The beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. We see these beautiful pictures coming together right here. And again, we need to see it as a package deal, a system. That's what the Old Covenant is. And that is embodied in the tabernacle. That's why it's referenced as a main package deal. All the shadows and patterns and the offerings and the sacrifices and the different liturgy and acts that they went through, it's all summed up by the tabernacle. Because that was the container. That is where it all took place. And so instead of focusing on just one aspect of it or one shadow or figure such as the sacrifices or Passover or the first fruits or other different events that took place within that, when we back out and look at the whole picture, we're looking at what was the whole system that was set up. That was represented by the tabernacle. That represented the old covenant. And that is what was set up on the very first day of the first month. And of course, the tabernacle moved around in the wilderness as the Israelites traveled. But then it was also set up in Shiloh. And it was transitioned a little bit into the tent that David set up. But ultimately in the temple at Jerusalem. All these are embodiments of the Old Covenant. But it's not limited to the Old Covenant. And this is very important for us to remember even as New Testament Christians. The temple is still a figure of the true. It is still a pattern of what is in the heavens. Even though the Old Covenant was replaced and Jesus Christ is now the High Priest and He was the one offering once forever, the temple is still a figure of the true. The temple is still an important picture even for New Testament Christians. Jesus Christ Himself called it my Father's house. And even the Bible tells us that the New Testament Christians, the early church, even gathered at the temple considering it a house of prayer because that is what it was. Our Father's house is a house of prayer. New Testament Christians knew that. Jesus Christ knew that. And it does us good to remember that the temple will still be during the tribulation. It's going to come back onto the scene. But it's also going to be during the millennial time. When all the nations go to Jerusalem regularly for the different commemorations and the Feast of Tabernacles. The temple is still going to be rehearsing the pictures and patterns that Jesus Christ fulfilled. Because it still, still, still is a figure of the true. And so we got to keep this in mind as we look at prophecy and the upcoming events. We know it will still figure very prominently during the millennial time. And it's going to figure very prominently during the tribulation time too. And so we must understand it from a New Testament perspective. Now yes, it's still a very powerful figure of the true. That's why it's still going to be used. Because it still presently is being used. Everything that was fulfilled in the patterns and the figures, the shadows of the temple and the tabernacle, they're still ongoing today. The veil is still open today. Our understanding of what Jesus Christ did and what he's still presently doing as our high priest today who makes intercession for us today before the throne of God, that is still an understanding that this temple is still a figure of the true. And it's still actively engaged. Those shadows that he has fulfilled, they're still ongoing today. I've seen a lot of Christians who act as though the whole temple was done away with. And all those pictures whatsoever with the Old Covenant. The sacrifices and the offerings, that was done away with. But the temple is still our Father's house. And Jesus Christ is still fulfilling the roles of all those shadows up in heaven. Of which the temple is a pattern of the heavenlies. A figure of the true. This is again why it will be very prominent during the tribulation and millennium. Because it is still important. And those pictures are still important. Those shadows of the true are still important. And it's going to remind them, particularly during the millennium, of how Jesus Christ did fulfill those. What he has done on our behalf. And so we also keep this in mind, this template of the temple tabernacle. It is a picture, a collection of an entire system. It's not a building. Don't look at it as just a building. It's a collection of all the shadows and figures and patterns of the true. Of what is in the heavens too. So this is very important of why an embassy template is also needed down here on the earth. Because it is a figure of the true. And we looked at this in Hebrews where the Apostle Paul explains. He goes through what did Jesus Christ do at the temple? And this is very important for us even as New Testament Christians that the Apostle Paul goes through and explains the importance of the tabernacle and temple for us to understand what Jesus Christ is doing presently. Presently the veil is open. And he rehearses how there was a tabernacle and all the elements and furniture and shadows and figures that were within the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the collection. But, Hebrews 9:11, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come 
by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. There is a greater and more perfect tabernacle, but the one that was made of hands it is a shadow of the true, of the greater tabernacle. Christ became a high priest of the good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. He fulfilled the shadows and patterns that were demonstrated down on earth by what was made by hands. And because he fulfilled those, he is the mediator of the New Testament. And it is our understanding of the tabernacle temple that we can see that Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. It is vitally important in our understanding as we look for Jesus Christ that the temple tabernacle is part of our understanding. Why is he appearing a second time? Why did he even come the first time? If we do not understand the importance of the temple tabernacle as a collection of a covenant, then we won't understand why is he coming back. A lot of Christians are focused just on the rapture and they, they want an escape. And yes, that is what the rapture is, but a lot of them just have a shallow understanding because they don't search out what was fulfilled. And so they think of just the rapture as only an escape. No, it's a greater part of Christ fulfilling what he already has done and what he's going to do. And if you don't see the larger picture, you won't see where you are. You won't see the day approaching and you won't see that his appearing is very nigh even at the door. It is by understanding the temple tabernacle that we can see the day approaching. Understanding what Jesus Christ did in that, but then also what he still has to do prophetically. And right after the Apostle Paul rehearses what Jesus Christ did with the temple tabernacle covenant, that whole collection, chapter 10, verse 13, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. That is the next prophetic chapter. And so this is very important that we understand the crucial importance of the temple tabernacle is going to be part of understanding future events too. You won't understand what's coming next during the tribulation time period if you don't understand the temple tabernacle and why the Apostle Paul emphasized it's so important before, but it's going to be very important after the tribulation events start too. And then the Apostle Paul went in how Jesus Christ is the new and living way. He completed the old covenant, but he still embodies that covenant. Those figures, those shadows, he embodies them. There is a new and living way through him, but we have to understand the temple tabernacle. There is a new and living way. There's also more of what's coming too. More chapters on the prophetic scene. And the more that we understand the temple tabernacle, we will be able to see the day approaching. Because these pictures are going to come up rippling through the future too. We will not be able to see the day approaching unless we understand what Jesus Christ did. What did he do the first time? Why are we even expecting to see him a second time? Because of what he did the first time. And the more that we see that first time, the more we can see that first time parallel the templates in our time. And so as our Father has brought our attention to the beginning of the year meets the ending of the year, the first and the last of the year, the Alpha and Omega of the year, is also bringing our attention to the plan of redemption that Jesus Christ, our mediator, was fulfilling this picture that was instituted and anchored to this time of the Alpha and the Omega of the year, the beginning and the end of the year. This picture that we need to know to see the day approaching, and this temple tabernacle picture that we need to see and keep in mind as we look for him to appear the second time, this picture, this covenant, these figures and these shadows are anchored to a very specific time, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega of the year, the first day of the year. And so when the Apostle Paul concludes by saying, as ye see the day approaching, that brings a lot more to mind and has a lot more depth that makes us think and ponder, is he really talking about the day when these pictures were instituted? When this covenant, when these shadows were actually physically set up? Because the Bible emphasizes what day that was. Exodus 41, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And thou shalt put therein the ark of the testimony, and cover the ark with a veil, and set up everything that is going to be in the tabernacle. Set it all up. Verse 17. 
And it came to pass in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was reared up. Okay, so this is very important how Scripture emphasizes a day is connected to this covenant, this picture that embodied the old covenant. It was set up on a very particular day. And that was the first day of the first month. And it's really fascinating to read this whole chapter of Exodus 40 because he's telling them, I want you to set up the tabernacle on this day. On this very day is when I want you to do it. Not when you're ready or whenever you want to do it. No, set it up on this day. Thou shalt do it on this day. And I want you to set it up completely. They didn't just move in and all the furniture and then do nothing. No, you read the chapter. They set up everything, everything. It was ready to go. It was going into service that day. That day. Verse 24, talking about Moses. And he put the candlestick in the tent of the congregation over against the table on the side of the tabernacle southward. And he lighted the lamps before the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the golden altar in the tent of the congregation before the veil. And he burnt sweet incense thereon, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set up the hanging at the door of the tabernacle. And he put the altar of burnt offering by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, and offered up on it the burnt offering and the meat offering, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar, and put water therein, to wash withal. And Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet thereat. When they went into the tent of the congregation, and when they came near unto the altar, they washed, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar, and set up the hanging at the court gate. So Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation, because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and the fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. I hope several things came to mind as we rehearsed that passage there. But again, take note that God told him, set the tabernacle up on this day and set up everything in it. You're not just moving the furniture in, you're setting up everything. Light the candlestick, put bread on the table of showbread, put incense on the altar, Light it. Give it. Set up the altar. Give a burnt offering on it. The tabernacle is going to go into use the very first day of the year. The very first day of the year. And when everything was fully set up and ready to go and used, that is when the glory of the Lord came and filled the tabernacle. And it's so beautifully described as a cloud covering the tent of the congregation. The glory of the Lord. And so again, this is so beautiful how it's being emphasized this will be set up. Uh, Moses, I want you to set it up on this exact day and put it into use right on that exact same day. And on that same day, the glory of the Lord, the presence of the Lord came and dwelt in the tabernacle. It dwelt among the Israelites there. Which is so beautiful to read through this passage and remember that Jesus Christ fulfilled all those patterns and that this covenant was embodied by the tabernacle that was set up on the very first day. And it emphasizes on the very first day a cloud descended on the tabernacle. And it was taken up from the tabernacle too when it was time for his children to go forward on their journey. And so that brings a lot to mind as we are expecting to meet our Redeemer in the clouds when we are going to be moving forward on our journey too. So there's a lot that comes together but that is emphasized went into effect on the first day of the first month. The very beginning of the year which we would know as Rosh Hashanah, the new year. And even the Jews today, they do acknowledge that technically the first day of the first month is Rosh Hashanah. It is technically the New Year's. And you'll find different Jewish groups that still observe the first day of the first month as the true Rosh Hashanah. And so this is, again, important for us to remember, the Alpha and Omega picture. Why is it so important that the tabernacle, this picture that embodied all the shadows and figures of the Old Covenant, was set up on the very first day of the whole year, on New Year's? And it was set up on the first day of the first month of the second year. The second year? What, well, that brings to mind what happened on the first year. What were the Israelites doing on the first year 
a year ago before they set the tabernacle up. Exodus chapter 12, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And he goes further into giving instructions for the upcoming Passover. Okay, so this is very important. Keeping in mind what's going to happen in a year from now, the tabernacle is going to be set up on the first day of the first month, in the second year. So here, a year prior, the children of Israel are still in the land of Egypt. And that emphasis is made. In the land of Egypt, God was giving Moses and Aaron advance notice of something very important. What was that? They were about to leave. They were about to leave. And he was telling them to the day when they would be leaving. That would be on Passover day. But when did he give them that announcement? It was on the first day of the first month. And he told them, tell this to the congregation that they need to get a lamb and they need to go through all this because there is going to be on a certain day these events. They were foretold that they were about to leave on the first day of the first month. But this wasn't the first time that he had mentioned it to them. Chapter 11, And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards he will let you go hence. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. So this is important as we see the first day of the first month emphasized right here in a context where God is telling the Israelites, you are about to leave. You are going to leave and it's going to be very suddenly. Right before the first day of the first month, he already told them, you are about to leave. I want you to start getting ready to leave. I want you to borrow things from your neighbors, the Egyptians. You see... The Israelites had an understanding that their time to leave was coming up very quickly, right before the first day of the first month. He gave them instructions that they needed to do, instructions they needed to follow. Then on the first day of the first month, he gave them very specific down to the day instructions of, you will be leaving on this day. The instructions I gave you before was to get you ready so that you are ready to leave immediately on that day, because when Pharaoh lets you go, he will surely thrust you out hence altogether. It's going to happen very quickly. And that is why I also emphasize during Passover, you need to be girded up. You need to have your staff with you. You need to be dressed, ready to start walking during Passover while you are observing the Passover meal. You need to be fully dressed and ready to leave out the door. So again, as we are looking for Jesus Christ to appear the second time, keeping in mind what he did the first time, fulfilling a greater tabernacle, a new and living way, that is tied and anchored to the first day of the first month, reminds us also the first exodus, when his redeemed people were led out of the land, out of the land of Egypt. It was a few days after the first day of the first month, but that was when the announcement went out. And just prior to that New Year's, they were told, get ready, start cutting the apron strings, so to speak, get ready to leave, you are getting ready to leave. So this is a powerful picture for us as we are expecting to leave Exodus 2. The Exodus 2. Right here as what are the celestial heavens pointing to? The celestial sea. The celestial sea right next to Aquarius that is pouring out the living water to the fish that is at his feet. With Pisces, the fish right next to him. Right in the celestial sea. And right here at this very time, while the heavens are declaring that picture, we are reminded what happened on the first day of the first month. The instructions were given out. Get ready to leave. You're getting ready to leave. You're only a few days away from leaving. That announcement was made on the very first day. On Rosh Hashanah, the evacuation notice was given out. So again, as we consider what the heavens are declaring right now, and what's on the last page of the Bible connected to, Behold, I come quickly. We have every reason to know that our Redeemer is nigh, even at the door. Nigh at the door. And we need to be dressed and ready to go out that door too. Because time is so very short. Jesus Christ was a prophet who was greater than Moses. Moses is the one who led the children of Israel out of the land on Exodus. We are expecting the one who is greater of a new and living way that replaced the old covenant. We are expecting him to come back and pick up his purchased possession. Another Exodus leaving another land of Egypt.
And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. Powerful, powerful reminders right here at this very prophetic and celestial time. Reminded also that what Christ fulfilled was a pattern of the heavenlies. And it's the heavens that are declaring the glory of God, reminding us it's time for another exodus. This is what we see. This is what we're reminded when we look at the timeline right now. We are in the days of Noah and Lot. We know a flood is coming. We have all these water themes even reminding us on the celestial clock too. Sudden destruction is coming. And we have this reminder again. We do not know the day or the exact hour. But we do know our master is returning. And he is the one who told us to watch. And so the more that we heed his instructions, the more that we have an ear to hear, the more we pay attention to what he shows us. Not looking off a month or two from now, no. The more that we have an ear to hear, we will hear what he's trying to show us right now today and what he is showing us right now. Particularly the richness and depth, how the tabernacle, the temple, sums up everything that Jesus Christ did. Everything. And Jesus Christ became a greater and more perfect tabernacle of the new and living way. And he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the ending. He is the first and the last. And everything that he is showing us right now points to this incredible time. Right here at the end of March and the beginning of April. We don't know a day or hour, but we can see the reminders about the ending of the year meets the beginning of the year. So right here we have expectation that, that we need to be girded up. We need to have our staff ready to go. We need to be ready to go out that door. Because there will be an escape. And the snare, the sun destruction, is about to come onto the world. But this is also a very interesting time because this was also approximately the time when Lazarus was raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead a few days prior to Passover. And so again, somewhere right around here, the Bible isn't specific to what day it was, but just that it was a few days before Passover, we have this very strong reminder how Jesus Christ will raise the dead. It doesn't matter the state of their body, that they're decomposed, they're gone to dust, like Lazarus was starting to decompose. That doesn't matter. Jesus Christ has power over death. He has power to raise even from the ashes. He has power to raise and make man even from dirt. There are no limits on Christ's power over death. He will raise the dead, and that is our expectation, that them that sleep in Christ that have already gone before us in the New Testament church we have the expectation, us who are alive and remain out of the New Testament church, there's only a small percentage of us who are alive and remain. You know, most of the church has already died and gone on before us. There's just a small percentage of the church that is still alive and remaining even now today. Most of the church has gone on before us. They are going to be raised and we are going to meet them in the clouds. And these beautiful pictures, these reminders, both of them are right here at this threshold of the year. At this new year, the raising of the dead, a leaving, an exodus, a greater and more perfect tabernacle. So many reminders coming together right here. But we are also reminded here, just like on the very first day, the Israelites were told the exact day that they were leaving. They were given instructions, get ready to leave. You will be leaving on X number of days. And it's going to happen very quickly. You're not going to have time to do it on that day. You need to get ready now. Be ready for that day of evacuation. Be ye ready. And then we look at the same time, we are reminded it was right prior to Passover. Just hours away from Passover, Jesus Christ was giving these very instructions for us. That is when he foretold, I'm going to be sending a comforter, and he is going to bring to remembrance everything that I have said unto you. Everything. And I want you to observe it, and I want you to teach all nations for the Gentiles too, to observe whatsoever I have said unto you, because all of my instructions are for you too, and for all the nations too. The last verses of Matthew emphasizes that real clear. Don't let any cult leader tell you that the Gospels are written to different people and only some apply to the New Testament church. That's a bold-faced lie. Christ gave very clear instructions. Teach to all nations whatsoever I have said unto you. All of it. And the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. All of it. So here at this very late hour, it is imperative we also review the instructions Jesus Christ gave to us. Just like the Israelites right before the Exodus, when they realized they had a certain number of days left, it is very important that they make themselves ready. Likewise for us, we are given instructions. 
And we are pointed to an understanding that we will see the day approaching. And that we should be making ourselves ready and be found girded in His service and with our lights burning when He comes. We are given instructions. Given instructions that we are to observe. That time is also when he emphasized, I will come again. I'm going to my father's house to prepare a place for you. And I will come again to receive you, take you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. That promise was done here at this time. But he gave instructions with it. Watch and be ye ready. I am coming during the days of Noah and Lot. Remember Lot's wife of that story. He gave these instructions right at the same commemoration time as Exodus. Remember, the crucifixion was on Passover, which was when Exodus took place. So the whole time between the first of the year through Passover, he was emphasizing instructions. And the disciples could see these parallels between the first Exodus, which they were rehearsing and commemorating right at that time, with the instructions he was given, one day I'm going to come back for you and I'm going to take you out of this place. Our master has given instructions, and they will be very important on that day. God gave instructions on the first day of the first month regarding Passover. And this is something we need to keep in mind too when God emphasizes, remember Lot's wife. Instructions are given for a reason, and he will be faithful to what he has promised he will do. So this needs to be a very sober reminder for us. Remember Lot's wife, remember Exodus, remember the gravity of the situation there, and why we are told to watch and be sober. Not get caught up in romanticized, novelized ideas of the rapture. No, follow instructions that he gave us. Forget about fictional books about the rapture. Just throw, throw them away. What does scripture say? What did Jesus Christ say? What did he want us to observe? He wants us to make ourselves ready. As we see that day approaching, and we should approach it very soberly, remembering there is only going to be one escape. Through the sea. Through the sea. And it also sobers us up that at the same time as when he prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem. Remember at the triumphal entry, right as he was coming over the hill, the Mount of Olives, and he overlooked Jerusalem and the temple, and he realized that most of Jerusalem was not receiving him as their Messiah. There were the disciples and there were a few other people who were celebrating Hosanna, but for the large part, Jerusalem and the religious leaders rejected Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the very one who came to fulfill all the pictures and shadows and patterns of the temple which lay right there on the horizon, right in their view, and the religious leaders of that very same temple and tabernacle rejected Jesus Christ. And friend, unless you understand the importance of the temple and the tabernacle, you will not understand why Jesus Christ cursed Jerusalem at that very moment. The crowds were shouting Hosanna and the religious leaders rejected him and said, Just tell them to be quiet. And Jesus said, Jerusalem, you're going to be cursed because you were not watching. You did not know that this was your very prophesied day when your Messiah was coming. The Passover lamb that even your father Abraham foretold. On this very day, he comes into the city and your religious leaders of that very temple tabernacle picture reject Jesus Christ. And they crucified him. And it was at this time, at the trial entry, that Jesus Christ declared a judgment on Jerusalem. Because they were not watching. Because they did not make themselves ready. And so he foretold their destruction. And that came in AD 70 with Titus. And we have even in our world today the memorial, the Arch of Titus, which reminds us of the reality of Jesus Christ's promises. He is faithful that promised. And he wants to find his servants watching when he comes, knowing he's coming. The religious leaders of his time, even the religious leaders of the very temple tabernacle, knew that was an expected time, knew he was a man of heaven, knew he showed signs and wonders, and yet they still rejected him. And so they were judged. Jerusalem was judged because they were not watching and making themselves ready to receive their Messiah. And friend, this is right in context where he gave his disciples the warning. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. I want to find you girded in my service and with your lights burning when I come. And so this is a very sober time as we reflect on what happened on that triumphal entry. Why he judged Jerusalem. Why the religious leaders of the very picture and pattern that Jesus Christ was going to fulfill rejected him. 
all these pictures, all these instructions, everything coming to mind, what was instituted on the first day of the first month, and here we are just hours away from that. And when I'm reminded, the Lord brought my attention to the model of the temple that I had built last year. I'd been building it for several years, stopped for a while, then finally finished it last year, if you remember in some of my videos. And the Lord just brought it to my attention today. It just really stood out because I have it setting on my kitchen table, so I see it every single meal. But just today, it, it struck me in a new reality with the time we we're approaching the New Year's, the first day of the first month. Remembering the soberness of what happened on the triumphal entry, those who rejected him, who was coming to fulfill the very pictures that were embodied in the very structure that they could see on the horizon right there. And he brought so much to mind about what the Apostle Paul rehearsed of how Christ fulfilled these shadows and patterns. And he is a new and living way. He is the greater tabernacle, but it is a pattern of things in the heavenlies. But then also the role that this is going to have in the days ahead too, in prophecy. When Christ appears the second time and starts to make his enemies his footstool, this same structure is going to come back onto the prophetic scene again and even go into the millennial time because it is that important and it is going to be a high gauge of who will reject the Messiah again. Just like when he came the first time at his first coming. Rejected by even those who worked in the very temple itself. And the more that we have a rehearsal and insight into the depth of these pictures and patterns and shadows that are very presently a real in our faith and the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at the throne of God even today, the veil is still open today, the more we can see these pictures and patterns but also see the incredible depth and soberness of why this is going to be so important in the days ahead. So very important. So very important that it will be rehearsed throughout the entire millennial time period for a thousand years. It is so important. And especially as we remember that the celestial heavens have already foretold the great and terrible day of the Lord is coming. The day of indignation is coming. Sudden destruction is coming. And these events are about to start. He is about to start making his enemies his footstool very, very shortly. The next prophetic events. When the world will stand up and reject Messiah again. Again. Even at the very temple itself. Revelation 13, 6, talking about the beast, the Antichrist. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. You will not understand why there is going to be a temple built if you think it's just a building during the tribulation. It's so much more than a building. Satan absolutely hates the tabernacle. He absolutely hates everything it represents. He already hates God. He hates his name. And he's going to hate his tabernacle. He's going to blaspheme the tabernacle. Why? Because it's a pretty building? No. Because it's the embodiment of everything that Jesus Christ has done since the foundation of the world. The lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. Why does Satan hate that? Because... Jesus Christ did not die for the angels. He did not die for the demons. He did not die for Satan. Who did he die for? He died for the man that he made from dirt. Mankind that he made from dirt. God so loved his creation, mankind. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That love was extended to mankind, to us, the wretched sinners who have gone astray. That love was extended to mankind. That offer of reconciliation was extended to mankind, not the angels. But God showed his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And this is why Satan hates God. This is why he hates his name. This is why he especially hates his tabernacle. Because of what it represents of God's love toward mankind that Satan will never be able to avail himself of. Never. There will be a real temple built during the tribulation time. There will be a real temple during the millennial time. Because it's to be a picture and reminder of the shadows and figures that Jesus Christ fulfilled to demonstrate his love for the world. 
And that's why Satan hates it. He hates it with unbridled passion. And that's why he blasphemes God. He blasphemes his name. And he blasphemes his tabernacle because it represents everything Satan will never have. Never have. And them that dwell in heaven, the angels up in heaven, those who are raptured and taken up into heaven, the bride of Christ. That's never going to happen for Satan. He hates that. He hates it. And that is why he directs his anger and fury against the only tangible aspect that he can touch. That is the tabernacle and the Christians who are here during the tribulation. Those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's the only tangible thing he can actually touch and vent his anger on. Those two things. But he can also touch the entire world too. And that's why he focuses on the tabernacle and wants to sit there. The tribulation is centered around what embodies the figures of the true, what is in the heavenlies. It's not a building. It represents God's love for all of mankind and how He sent His Son as a lamb to die on our behalf and offered salvation, the living water to all the world, but did not offer it to Satan. So there's no greater picture that Satan hates that embodies Jesus Christ and what he did from the foundation of the world, then the temple, the tabernacle that was set up. Because the temple still is a figure of the true. And that is why the veil was ripped in the temple when Jesus Christ died on the cross, because there is a direct correlation between the temple and the very throne room of God. And Satan knows that. He knows what he does at the physical temple will spit right in the face of God right at his throne. And Satan is fully aware of everything that the temple represents. It is a complete system. It represents the whole new covenant. The new covenant enabled by its high priest, Jesus Christ. Of the pattern in the temple and the heavenlies. There's a lot of false teaching that has gone out in the past two years where people are dismissing the role of the temple during the tribulation time period and trying to tie it to some stupid vaccine. It's toxic, but it has nothing to do with the mark of the beast. If you do not understand salvation, if you do not understand redemption, if you do not understand what Jesus Christ did and why the temple was so important, why it was set up on the first day and the first month of the year, you will not understand what's coming in the future. If you do not understand what happened the first time, you will not understand what happens when Christ appears the second time. And there is so much false teaching on YouTube today that betrays that those false teachers have no understanding of even salvation. If they don't even understand such an important subject as salvation, then what do they know worth listening to on other subjects? This is why the Apostle Paul rehearsed it. Rehearsed what it represented, how Christ fulfilled it, and emphasized we will see the day approaching, but then take very careful note what he keeps going right into. Paul rehearsed how Jesus Christ offered one sacrifice for sins forever. He sat down at the right hand of God as our high priest, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. And we should be exhorting one another and so much more as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Let's pause right there. Why is he saying that right here? Right after he says we will see the day approaching. And then he talks about what about if we reject that knowledge of the truth? What is he talking about? Well you got to back up to chapter 9. You got to back up a little bit more too. What has he been talking about Jesus Christ? He's talking about Jesus Christ came to be the only Savior, to be the only High Priest, to be the only sacrifice for sins. There is only one temple. There is only one tabernacle. There is only one covenant. There is only one new and living way. And if you reject that new and living way, there is no other temple to go to. There is no other sacrifice you can go to. There is no other High Priest you can go to. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, that there is only one mediator between God and man, if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. There is nothing left on the table. The only thing remaining is a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye? Shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under foot the Son of God? 
and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You won't understand this particular passage if you don't understand what he had just been talking about. He would just been talking about Jesus Christ is the only high priest. He's the only temple. He's the only offering. And if you reject Jesus Christ, knowing, especially knowing he's the only way, there is no other sacrifice for you. The only thing that you can expect is judgment from the very one you have rejected. Even in the Gospels, Jesus Christ warned, if you deny me, I will deny you. And that's the same thing that Paul is rehearsing here. But you have to understand how he's rehearsing. What did Jesus Christ do? What did he become? What is he now of the new and living way? If you reject that new and living way, there is no other way. The only thing that you have coming to you is vengeance and indignation by the one you rejected. Verse 32, he's emphasizing to the Hebrews who are persecuted during this time. He makes it very personal. He says, I know you're persecuted during this time. And it's a trial on your faith. You are afflicted. They are persecuting you. They want you to deny Jesus Christ. They want you to blaspheme Jesus Christ. Don't do it. Don't do it. Be faithful. Keeping in mind what Jesus Christ did for you. He is your high priest. He is your offering. He is the summation of the tabernacle temple. He is a new and living way because he has fulfilled it all. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Does this passage sound very familiar with what is coming prophetically? It should. Because this is what is going to happen in the future. This is happening even in our world today, but it's definitely going to be happening even in the tribulation. Remember, even the Apostle Paul himself, he persecuted the early church, causing some of them to even blaspheme God. The Apostle Paul knew very well what he is talking about in this passage. And he was rehearsing what Jesus Christ has done for us. The template of the temple tabernacle. How Jesus Christ became our high priest, our offering, our sacrifice. By a greater and more perfect tabernacle. And by understanding and holding fast to what he has done for us, we can go boldly before the throne of God. It doesn't matter the afflictions or persecution. We can go boldly before the throne of God. We can hold fast to our mediator who makes intercession for us. And this is what the Apostle Paul is encouraging those who are persecuted at that time, but also for the time ahead. He is even recalling how Jesus Christ, our mediator, will come. We need to be faithful to him, holding fast to him till he comes. These instructions are not just for those before the tribulation, folks. These instructions will go right into the tribulation. For those believers who bear witness and testimony of Jesus Christ, they will have to hold fast to Jesus Christ, hold fast to what he has done on their behalf, Keeping in mind the promise, yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and he will not tarry. Why? Because this is what the enemy is going to be doing during the tribulation. Pressing on them to deny Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one who fulfilled all the pictures and patterns of the temple tabernacle. This is what the son of perdition is going to be especially pressing at the midst of the tribulation and onward. Bringing everyone to evaluate a decision. Will you deny Jesus Christ, the only mediator, the only high priest, the only sacrifice? Will you deny him and reject him? That is the crux of why the Antichrist blasphemes the tabernacle of God. Because what it represents. Because he wants the whole world to openly reject the new and living way. And he will take that rejection right up to the very steps of the temple. And that is why he sets up his abomination there, because it is a total rejection of everything that the temple tabernacle stands for, the entirety of the new and living way. It's all embodied in the temple. And that is why the temple services will still go through the millennial time period for a thousand years. Because it is still a picture and template of the new and living way. 
there will be a physical temple in Jerusalem during the tribulation because Satan knows how important it is and what it represents. Be sure to check out our short playlist, Sola Scriptura, Mark of the Beast Studies, which goes over the vaccine claims. It may be a toxic cocktail, but it's not the Mark of the Beast. It has nothing to do with the Mark of the Beast. It has nothing to do with the system of the Mark of the Beast. Watch our playlist. We go verse by verse of what the Bible says the Mark of the Beast is. It's very simple, but it's extremely deep. Extremely deep. Also check out our PDF resources at rapturelibrary.com about the Mark of the Beast. 2 Thessalonians 2. The Apostle Paul foretells us that the man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition, the son of destruction, which is literally Apollyon, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Notice that this is almost an exact quote of what is in Revelation spoken of by Jesus Christ. Because they're both saying the same thing. The understanding's the same. It's going to be a literal temple, yes. The Antichrist, he's going to be known as a very blasphemous person. He's going to have the spirit of Apollyon. He's going to come out of the bombless pit. He's going to be blaspheming God. He's going to be blaspheming his name. He's going to be opposing anyone who worships God. He's going to be especially opposing the temple of God, blaspheming his tabernacle. And the Antichrist is going to set himself up there as the chief God that should be worshipped. To replace God. To replace the mediator who accomplished the new and living way that is embodied by that temple picture. The Antichrist is going to walk right up there and say, no, reject this. Worship me instead. Worship me instead. And the implications of that are very clearly spelled out by the Apostle Paul in Hebrews and Jesus Christ in Revelation. Because the Antichrist fully knows what that represents. If you sin willfully after you receive knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. The Antichrist in the context of the temple and what Jesus Christ has done is going to call on the world to openly reject, full knowingly, Jesus Christ, the new and living way. They will know exactly what they're doing. That's why Jesus Christ says, if you worship the beast, you will be damned to hell. Because there is no other sacrifice. There is no other high priest. And if you reject the only mediator between God and man, you are damned to hell. Friend, we're at a threshold time where we are reminded of the upcoming Passover events, but also the triumphal entry when Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem but as he crested over the Mount of Olives, there before him lay Jerusalem and the temple. And it was right there, overlooking such a sight that the religious leaders, their dark hearts, they even there rejected Jesus Christ. And that is why he judged the city. Because the very ones, even at the very steps of the tabernacle, were the ones rejecting him to his face, knowing he was the Lamb of God. Knowing he was the Lamb of God. You will not understand the prophetic events that are coming if you do not understand what Jesus Christ already did when he came. We will only be able to see the day approaching if we understand the background of that day. Jesus forewarned that a snare is coming on the world. That Revelation 9 event, that time trap, when the bottomless pit is open and that son of perdition, the beast, ascends out of the bottomless pit. Apollyon. He's not coming from Martha's vineyard. He's not coming from the White House. He's not coming from some other place. He's coming from the bottomless pit. The Bible is very specific. And Christ explained this is going to be a time of great perplexity, particularly around the midst of the tribulation, around the abomination of desolation time, what the beast will be doing. Even Daniel the prophet warned that this will be a time that has not happened since the foundation of the world. That Revelation 9 and 11 event of the one who is going to oppose Hebrews 9-11. A snare is coming on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. The more that we read scripture, the more that we study scripture, the more that we ask our Father for wisdom, the more that we can see the depth of his warning of what is coming. It's not some simple geopolitical events. No, it's a bombless pit being opened into this world and the son of perdition leading the world in open rejection of the Lamb of God. He's going to especially start that at the midst of the tribulation, and he's going to gather his armies to march even up to the very man of God himself in battle against him at the end. 
Why? Because that is the thrust of the entire tribulation. It is not about some stupid vaccine or setting up some system. He knows it's going to be a self-destructing system going all the way down, making the world a wilderness, destroying it as it goes forward, all with vengeance against the Son of Man. And he will take as many people as he can with him as he goes. He will be blaspheming God. He will be blaspheming his name. He will be blaspheming his temple. And Jesus Christ explicitly warned us to be living as though we see that day approaching, to take heed to ourselves, to be watching, watching first of all ourself, watching our heart, that we are serving Jesus Christ first and highest above all else too, that we don't have someone else sitting on the throne of our heart either. We need to watch ourselves and pray always. Keep the fellowship and lines of communication open. Purify yourself. Purify yourself and pray always. The tabernacle was set up on Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the first month. And it was set up in the second year after the first year warned of an escape. Warned them that they need to make themselves ready. Warning them that they will need to be ready to go. Warning them that they will be thrust out quickly. There is a lot that is brought to our mind that is pointed to right now of what Christ did in the past, the old covenant, the new covenant, the new and living way, pegged to the first day of the year, which meets the end of the year, the Alpha and the Omega. And it is by understanding this picture and pattern, which is of the heavenlies as well, and that Christ fulfilled these shadows and patterns of a greater and more perfect tabernacle in the heavenlies. Our attention is brought to this same threshold, keeping in mind the prophetic events that are coming right past that threshold too. Somewhere right around here, Christ will be continuing what he started. There are a lot of promises that are also brought to mind. Again, read chapter 40. Again, they set it all up. And what happened? The cloud descended. The glory of God descended. And when the people were to move on forward, the cloud ascended. It lifted up. We have these beautiful pictures even acted out that tie to promises of even our own expectation. To meet our Redeemer, the new and living way, our High Priest, our offering to meet Him in the clouds. His clouds. To be taken to our Father's house, where He has gone to prepare a place for us. All this is brought to mind with this template of the Temple Tabernacle. I was also reminded of Psalm 27, 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. In the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. A beautiful picture also reminds us of Isaiah 26, being called into the chamber of safety. Being called into our Father's house. Our Father's house. Do you know what Jesus Christ called our Father's house? A greater and more perfect tabernacle. That's in the heavenlies. So many promises of the exodus, of the pickup of a purchased possession, brought to mind as we consider the template of the tabernacle, and why they keep being brought to mind with these same promises, these same expectations. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show with his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. The heavens declare so many beautiful pictures here, particularly with the sun at the celestial sea, pointing at the fish. With also Jupiter, the king planet, right at the stream of water poured out by Aquarius. For the fish that is at his feet, that is also in the celestial sea. The heavens are declaring a beautiful picture right now. That is so beautifully described on the last page of the Bible. About the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. And that he is coming quickly. Reminded of the sun that has a tabernacle along the line. As a bridegroom coming out of his chamber remembering and looking at the new year, the Rosh Hashanah, my transition from one monthly chamber to the next, coming out of the old and into the new. So many pictures coming together right here at Rosh Hashanah, the new year, the first day of the first month. 
reminding us of our bridegroom, our expectation. Clouds, a lifting up, a going forward, a journeying, an exodus of a redeemed and purchased people. Right here, during these celestial reminders of the days of Noah and Lot, too. We do not know the day or hour, but we can certainly see we are running out of days and hours, and we have increasing reminders to redeem those days and hours. Because Scripture also reminds us in John 11:55 that many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Again, reminded of the instructions that God gave to Israelites before Rosh Hashanah, before the New Year, to start getting ready. You're getting ready to leave. And on the very day was the exact instructions of when they would be leaving. And that tied to Passover and the Exodus that happened on that day. But there's also a readying before that, understanding they need to purify themselves. Just like the priests in Aaron's son, there was a laver of water where they washed their hands and feet before they approached the altar, before they approached the sanctuary. Always approaching it with reverence, always approaching it with purity. We can go boldly before the throne of God, we can go boldly before the mercy seat. But we must pray always, we must watch our hands, our feet, our heart. We must purify ourselves before we approach the throne of God. This is part of watching, taking heed to ourselves, watching our heart, watching our hands, watching our feet. As we go through this life, purifying ourselves so that we are not found with spot or wrinkle, so we can be found blameless, so we can approach before the throne of God, blameless, with our hearts washed with pure water. If we regard iniquity in our heart, the Lord will not hear us. To approach the throne of God, even boldly, we must purify ourselves. And we have this reminder even here. This time of expectation where we are told directly by our Redeemer, watch and pray always. Pray always. Keep that line of communication open. Keep it always open. 1 John chapter 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us? What manner of love? When I behold the moon and stars, what is man? What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us? The more that we see and understand the tapestry of redemption, what was done for us, the love that was extended to us, the more we should love Him in return, the more we should desire to draw nigh to Him with a true heart, a purified heart. Desiring to sup with Him always. Desiring to press close to His side always. Desiring to let nothing come between us always. Watching and praying always. Watching and hearing our Redeemer always. Friend, here at this late hour where we have the hope and the expectation of Him appearing, the very One who redeemed us, our High Priest, our offering, the embodiment of the new and living way, the expression of of God's love toward us. We love Him because He first loved us. And the more that we search out how much He loves us, the more that should drive us to love Him in return. And this is what we should especially be doing here at this late hour, that we have this hope. We are presently the sons of God. We are presently redeemed when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We are adopted presently. We're just waiting for the pickup of the purchased possession to be taken to our Father's house. And as we have this hope of His appearing, let's purify ourselves. Let our life live in light of it. Let our life be a demonstration of the hope that is within us. The hope that is within us. Our Father is showing us so much at this late hour. Not just what the enemy is doing or the geopolitical events, but what the heavens declare about the glory of God. The glory of God that descended upon the tabernacle that descended on his picture, his expression of his love for mankind, how he has considered man and extended his love toward man to redeem and reconcile his creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the more that we look up and lift up our heads, we will know that our redemption draweth nigh. 
because we'll know the depth of it. We'll know the depth of the reality that he is coming to pick up his purchased possession. We will know the depth of his love. We just won't know the breadth and the length or the height. We will see the depth. We will know the depth because we will hear his voice. The more that we draw nigh to our bridegroom, the more we will hear him. The more we will hear him. And he has shown us so much depth about this time, so many encapsulations in the template, so much converging right here at the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, reminding us of the new and living way, the new and living way. And as the sons and daughters of God, we have the very present reality of the hope within us that he is coming to pick up his purchased and redeemed possession his redeemed possession, his redeemed people, his redeemed children. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and do good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Do you see the day approaching? Do you see it? Or do you just hear about it? Friend, that's what I want you to see. I don't want you to see a calendar day. I don't want you to see just morbid trivia knowledge. I want you to see the day. I want you to see the depth, not just of the day, but the hope that is in that day. We will not fully see the depth of that day. We will not see the importance of that day until we see the importance of who is coming, who came the first time. Why is he going to appear a second time? And the more that we study the first time, the more we will see, we will see the richness of the second time. And that will embolden us to go out and draw nigh to him even so much more because we will see the reality of the richness of it, the richness of the tapestry of redemption, the richness of the depth of his love for us. Because the more that we see it, the more it should cause us to say, Behold, what manner of love! What manner of love that thou considerest me. Behold what manner of love. And we will not be able to say that unless we can see that. Unless we can see that. So friend, time is very short. And I want to invite you to check out our resources in the description box. PDFs that rehearse. What are the instructions Jesus Christ gave us related specifically to this time. This very time of expectation for him to appear. The one who demonstrated such love for us. And friend, if we don't even have interest in studying what Jesus Christ said regarding this time, that demonstrates a lot of our thoughts regarding the love that was demonstrated toward us. Do we have an ear to hear at this late hour? That's going to be reflected in how we live, how we are listening, how we are rising up, how we are trimming our lamp. It all shows, are we listening? Do we have a desire to even listen? Do we have a desire to sit down and sup with the Redeemer who redeemed us? Our reaction at this late hour shows what kind of servants we are, what kind of children we are. It shows our love. It shows our love. He has told us he wants to find us ready. Just like the children of Israel before Exodus 1, we are expecting Exodus 2. These parallels with the time where we are at right now, with the beginning and the ending of the year, the Hebrews had the expectation from the very first day of the year that they were leaving. That they were leaving. And friend, that should be our expectation here too as our Father is drawing our attention to this exact same time. We need to be getting ready for Exodus. The Exodus of a redeemed people. And we need to be living like it. Making ourselves ready. Being found girded in a service and with our lights burning. Being found running for the prize. Running for the prize. Jesus Christ is the prize. He is the prize. Are we running out to meet him? Are we drawing nigh to him? That's going to be reflected in our life. Also check out our PDF serving Jesus Christ. First and highest above all else. Not partly in some. No, first and highest above all else. Because that is going to be a reflection of how much we love him. If we will give him all of our strength, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our heart. That is going to demonstrate how much we love our Lord. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. With all the reminders of the celestial sea and Aquarius pouring out the living water, let us remember these crucial instructions to watch and pray always, beholding the love that was demonstrated for us. We have heard so many trumpet calls at midnight that have told us one resounding message. The bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Go ye out to meet him. 
The more that we look in scripture and study the tapestry of redemption, the more that we see the bridegroom, the more that we see the depth and richness of why he is coming back. There is greater richness and anticipation of the bridegroom the more that we study the bridegroom and his incredible love for us. So let us rise up in loving return for our Savior. He loved us. Let's love him. Let our life demonstrate that we desire to draw nigh to him with a true heart, a sanctified heart, a purified heart, a loving heart, a genuine heart. As we go out to meet him, hearing him, heeding and obeying him, loving him and serving him first and highest above all else, holding fast to his words till he comes. Maranatha!